Hello, uh, I'm Evan Bloom. Uh, I'm a senior fellow at the Polar Institute of the Wilson Center, and on behalf of the Center, I'd like to welcome you today to a discussion about Southern Ocean conservation, and in particular about the history and achievements of the organization that deals with marine conservation in that part of the world, the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, which we refer to as CAMELAR. This year, CAMELAR is celebrating its 40th anniversary and holding its 41st meeting. The Antarctic Treaty Parties negotiated and established the Commission to provide the tools to govern cooperation with regard to marine conservation in Antarctica to handle both fisheries management as well as broader aspects of marine conservation. The Commission currently has 26 members, which includes the United States, as well as 11 exceeding states that are treaty parties. The membership includes all the countries that currently fish in Southern Ocean waters. Among organizations that manage fisheries, CAMELAR has often been considered one of the most effective. It has been on the cutting edge of establishing the rules for taking an ecosystem-based approach to conservation and promoting sustainable fishing, and has done so on the basis of the expertise provided by its scientific committee. Its commitment to science-based decision-making has been seen as a key to its success. But like any intergovernmental organization, especially one that involves cutting deals for shared resources, it has any, numbers, uh, any number of political controversies and disagreements. Most of its members have pushed for establishment of large-scale marine protected areas, and in 2016, CAMELAR established the world's largest MPA in Antarctica's Ross Sea, based on a proposal by the US and New Zealand. However, since then, the Commission hasn't been able to agree to new MPAs. I want to emphasize that international cooperation and conservation policies in the Southern Ocean need to be of concern to an American audience, even if Antarctica is rather far away. The Southern Ocean is a vast area of the planet. The Antarctic continent is in the middle, but the surrounding waters in the convention area cover some 36 million square kilometers. The Southern Ocean has a tremendous amount of marine life, including the fisheries that have been managed by CAMELAR since the, the mid 80s. But there are also lots of whales, seals, penguins, and loads of krill. This region is critical for efforts to tackle challenges related to protecting the planet's biodiversity and understanding climate change, and plays a key role in the international campaign to protect 30% of the world's ocean by 2030, the so-called 30 by 30 campaign. So we have a great panel today with speakers who have considerable depth of knowledge about CAMELAR and its work. For my part, as the former US commissioner to CAMELAR, I followed the commission and its activities closely and I'm glad to be able to convene such a well-experienced group from three key countries active in CAMELAR plus civil society. So uh, Am Ambassador Olivier Guillaume-Varche uh, currently serves as Ambassador of France to Jamaica and permanent representative to the International Seabed Authority. He is a career diplomat specializing in China, Asia, the law of the sea, and polar affairs, and he was formerly France's CAMELAR commissioner uh, and head of delegation to the ATCM. Ambassador Francisco Bergunio is Chile's current CAMELAR commissioner and head of the Division of Antarctic Affairs at the Chilean MFA. He also leads the Chilean, Chilean delegation to the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting and was uh, ambassador of Chile to South Africa from 2017 to 2021. Dr. Tony Press is an adjunct professor at the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies at the University of Tasmania. He was director of the Australian Antarctic Division from 1998 to 2009 and served as Australia's CAMELAR commis commissioner, as well as head of delegation and alternative representative to a number of Antarctic Treaty consultative meetings. Jim Barnes is a lawyer and co-founder of the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition, uh, and he served for many years uh, as general counsel of ASOC and as executive director from 2005 to uh, 2014. Today, he serves as ASOC, serves ASOC as board chair. Now, Camelot, uh, the Camelot Commission meets later this month in Hobart, 
In this one hour, my intention is to focus not on the particular issues that will arise for negotiation at this year's meeting, but more about what the Commission has achieved and where it might be going in the future. So if you have questions for the panelists, please send them via email to polar at wilsoncenter.org. That's polar at wilsoncenter.org. They will then be forwarded to me and I will do my best to pose some of them that will be of general interest. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Polar Institute Program Associate Jack Jerky for his assistance in arranging this program and also thank our IT colleagues at the Wilson Center who have uh, managed to put this together as, as well. So um, we were hoping to have uh, Olivier Guillaume Farsh. I don't see him on my screen. So I'd like uh, to start with Ambassador Bugunio. And uh, so could I ask you, uh, Francisco, about Chile's views about Camelar and what it has achieved over the past 40 years? Uh, what do you think about its history, achievements, and shortcomings? Thank you, Francisco. Thank you, Evan, and uh, many thanks to the Wilson Center for this invitation. Well, as you know, Chile is geographically the closest country to the Antarctic continent. It's a mere 900 kilometers from Cape Horn to the South Shetland Islands. And this explains why Chile has had an historic interest in Antarctica that goes back to the early days of our independence. We participated actively in the negotiations that led to the Antarctic Treaty and later in the negotiation of the Camelot Convention. Now, our interest in Camelot is threefold. We have fishing activities in the Southern Ocean, albeit uh, less today than what we had in the 1990s. We are a port state and quite, and quite an active one at that. And we have a very strong ocean conservation policy. So this triple condition obliges us to have a balanced approach in our Camelot involvement. Now, with regards to conservation, as, uh, when we consider that the Antarctic marine ecosystems are particularly unique and vulnerable, you can start to understand our interest in the protection of the Southern Ocean, naturally within Camelot context and, and Camelot mandate. The conservation of Antarctic marine biodiversity is a priority within our national Antarctic policy. And today we are working on a specific national policy on the conservation of the Southern Ocean. That's to say, uh, we're working on a white paper or policy paper that will spell out the fundamental issues that require our attention in the conservation of the ocean. One example, a well-known example of our work in this area is uh, the Chilean Argentinian initiative with an MPA proposal for domain one. That is to say the sea on the western side of the Antarctic Peninsula and south of the Scotia Arc. We began working on this project back in 2012 and the proposal has been before the commission since 2018. And we are bringing once again this proposal to the commission at this year's uh, October meeting, to say in a, in a few weeks time. There are of course other priorities that we see within Camelot. Mm -hmm. uh, these include the question of climate change and the introduction of this variable and decisions made by the commission. We are also interested in the introduction of best practices in Camelot fisheries. And for this, it's interesting to keep an eye on what's being done in regional fishery management organizations including SPRIFMA, where we are members. We are also keen on, on ensuring implementation of conservation measures through inspections at sea, and we traditionally conduct these inspections within sub-area 48.1. Now, these are just some examples of issues that we are concerned with. Uh, but I would like to come back to the, the question of uh, what Camilla has been doing, and but also how we see uh, Camelot going forward a little bit. So, uh, and this has to do with the objective of the Camelot Convention. For Camelot to continue to be successful, we believe that all commission members must be actively engaged in both in the scientific committee and the commission work. But more importantly, uh, we really believe that we must all have a common purpose. 
And this is something that Chile has tried to promote for some time now. In 1996, an agenda item on the, on the objective of the convention was introduced to try to encourage members to have a strategic discussion on priorities of the commission. And we have had this discussion uh, every year. And we'll have one once again this year. Uh, additionally, we have organized today two symposia, the Valdivia Symposium in 2005, uh, jointly with Australia. I hope Tony Press will have fond memories of that meeting. Uh, and then 10 years later, in 2015, we organized the Santiago Symposium that was co chaired by Australia, Chile, and the US. So you will recall, Evan, that you were co chairing also that meeting. And these were meetings that were informal in nature with Chatham House rules and oriented towards seeking common understandings on different strategic issues. And I think this is something that we really have to come back to. Last year, we presented a draft declaration for the 40 years of the Commission meeting. Uh, the idea behind this initiative was not only to celebrate the anniversary, the anniversary with a declaration, but also to encourage members in this process to review our past successes and give thought to current and future challenges. Now, past successes have been many. We have drastically reduced seabird mortality. We have effectively combated IUU activities in the convention area. We have developed an effective system of instruments or tools with a view to conserving marine biodiversity. And we have taken decisions for the protection of PMEs among many others. Most importantly, through this declaration, all members of the Commission reaffirm their commitment to work collectively and constructively to continue to enhance the functioning of the Commission and their commitment to the objective of the Community Convention. I believe today in an increasing global geopolitical tensions with increased tension at the commission level with important initiatives like MPA proposals that have been stuck at the commission level for some of them for nearly a decade, we need basically more dialogue. We need a better understanding of what consensus building means. We need most of all, uh, to recall that we have a common purpose and we need to acknowledge that common purpose, which is, in our understanding, the objective of the Convention, that is to say, the conservation of Antarctic marine living resources. So, thank you, Evan. Francisco, thank you very much. So, let me give the floor to Tony Press. Tony, oh, would you care to um, talk about that suite of issues? Yeah, thank you, and uh, thank you, Francisco. Um, I I'll do a bit of an historical trawl um, through my understanding of, of uh, Camelot's successes and my experience. First of all, I think the establishment of the scientific committee itself should be seen uh, as a success of Camelara and, and a functioning scientific committee um, divorced from the, in the main, uh, from the political actions of, of, of the members, a, a committee of scientific experts um, devoted to providing advice on the, on the purpose of the, of the convention. I think that's, that's a, a major success of of uh, Camelot. The use of precaution as a principle for establishing measures uh, and in the case that we know mostly um, measures for setting catch limits uh, but also precaution in, in other um, measures inside uh, the Commission itself as a major achievement and then combined with um, the ecosystem approach where Camelot really 
broke the water really in 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 establishing ecosystem based management in regional organizations then you look at the 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 various groundbreaking initiatives that underpin the success of of Kemala. And I'll pick a few of these. One is actually the coining of the expression IUU fishing, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, which gave a name to a group of activities. That in itself, it's now an now internationally used in fisheries organizations around the world, but coming out of a conservation organization like, like Kamala, um, it being able to name the beast, I think in itself was a really uh, important thing. And, and, and uh, the discussions around IUU fishing and, and the way it was tackled, uh, a major success in any uh, international organization's measure. <clears throat> the specific provisions of the catch documentation scheme to combat IUU fishing and the introduction of the early introduction of vessel monitoring systems as another means of combating IUU fishing uh, has to be seen as being uh, major successes of Camilla um, advice from the scientific committee then translated into decisions of the commission uh, and into uh, measures, legally binding measures. I also think uh, the work that has been done on bycatch provisions in the fisheries are absolutely groundbreaking. The, 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 the success of bycatch provisions against albatrosses are, is remarkable from tens of thousands of birds down to um, very, very, very few albatrosses and petrels being caught in the fisheries is, is, is a remarkable success. And um, also the demise of IEU fishing in the area itself um, has is a major achievement of Kamala and of non Kamala parties who joined the members of Kamala in um, regulating imports of of fish caught in the Kamala area. I I did have in my successors um, the Valdivia meeting on the future of Kamala as one of its successors. The the first one, uh, it was uh, an excellent chance to sit back away from the pressures of the commission meeting itself and to reflect uh, on the purpose of, of Kamala and, and what the future might look like. And the thing that stood out for me most in that discussion was the importance of the non-fishing countries in fulfilling the purpose of the convention itself. And I always start off my discussions um, about Kamala by saying it's not a regional fisheries management organization. Its purpose is the conservation of Antarctic marine living resources. And one of the things it does to meet that purpose is to take measures on regulating rational use in Antarctica. I agree that there are issues in the future that, that and, and currently that we need to look at. Um, they've been mentioned by Francisco, um, marine protected areas, 
methods of inspections, um, and ultimately the protection of particular ecosystems themselves. But we'll get to those in general discussion. So I just might leave my remarks just there. So Tony, thank you very much. Um, I see that Olivier Kionvash is trying to connect, but hasn't quite been able to do so yet. Um, so in any event, Jim, I'd like to turn the floor over to you. Uh, uh, Jim, you come from the perspective, not of a government, but of, from civil society and the main umbrella group that represents the NGO. So um, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Evan. Um, and thanks to the prior speakers because they've said a number of things. I won't have to say them, but that's good, very good. I just want to go back and have a little history at the very beginning. Uh, beginning in 1978, I was asked to serve as an NGO advisor on the U.S. delegations to annual Antarctic treaty meetings. And at that time in the 70s, Russia and several other states were carrying out extensive fishing uh, and they'd collapsed two major stocks by the late 70s. And there was intense global interest in krill, which many people were saying would feed the world. Uh, and since the Southern Ocean then was considered to be high seas, there were no fisheries regulations. Uh, prodded by NGOs, including uh, ASOC, which was founded in 1978 formally, and we'd begun working a couple of years before that. Um, among other things, we engaged um, Jimmy Carter, President Carter, to support our efforts to uh, convince governments to negotiate a treaty. And those began that same year, 78. And I just wanted to flag the uh, sublime efforts of a small number of scientists who helped develop uh, the innovative Article II. Uh, they included Bob Hoffman, who was then the uh, U.S. Marine Mammal Commission's chief scientist, uh, Richard Laws, who was the head of the British Antarctic Survey, Sidney Holt, who was a renowned whale scientist, and Dr. Lee Talbot, who was then Director General of IUCN, International Union for Conservation of Nature. And through their work and a number of other uh, people's work, the innovative Article II emerged with the ecosystem as a whole approach that's been mentioned. Um, interestingly, at least to me, from a historical point of view, is that the 1978 wildlife monograph by Holt and Talbot provided crucial intellectual framework, I believe, for Camel. And they've been working on that for two or three years. And those of us involved were drawing already on their work. And um, when we were trying to convince all the governments in 1960 finally to agree to Camelar, uh, Dick Laws in particular was very worried. He didn't think that a lot of people in the room really understand understood what an ecosystem is, much less what the Antarctic marine ecosystem was. And so, uh, and this was in Canberra, uh, Tony May, Tony, I can't remember if you were there in 1960. 80, but you may well have been. At any rate, we, he, Dick wanted to have the room darkened uh, so he could use the old-fashioned overhead projector. And he basically assumed his professorial robe and began to lecture uh, for more than an hour all the delegates with great graphs and everything to show them what was, what is the Antarctic marine ecosystem. And I think that was a crucial turning point to convince everybody to agree uh, in 1980 on Camelar, and even began it, it even began operating before it was legally enforced in 1982. So it was off to a great start. Uh, when I look back on those years, I note that the scientific committee from day one laid out a very ambitious agenda as they took control of Southern Ocean fishing, other than the illegal fishing that's been mentioned. And I believe the steps they took then laid the good foundation for properly managing all the potential fisheries for toothfish, krill, ice fish, and other species. But meanwhile, in those years, the uh, great whales, which have, which have been driven close to extinction, uh, slowly began their recovery since most whaling ceased after the 1982 uh, IWC moratorium. And Japan refused to honor the moratorium and it continued to take not insignificant numbers of minke and fin whales for a while uh, and for quite a while. Uh, but everybody else agreed to the moratorium. And baleen whales had been prodigious consumers of krill. 
But because they were no longer around, the, the estimated stock size of blue whales, the largest in that time frame, was thought to be 1% of its original stock size. So it was posited that the excess could be taken by humans. And very quickly, Russia and Japan started an exploratory krill fishery. Um, Antarctic toothfish, which uh, essentially plays the role of a shark in the Southern Ocean, because there are no sharks there, began to be uh, exploited in increasing numbers. And from my point of view, without the ecosystem implications being fully understood. And I believe that still remains the case. In spite of all the vast numbers caught uh, over the years, it's still called an exploratory fishery, which is to me a bit strange given the conservation mandate of the convention. So where are we today? Well, people have mentioned the words rational use a number of times. Um, and some states, uh, I think, are misunderstanding either on purpose or out of ignorance. It's never quite clear to me what, what's going on. That they, they stress the uh, rational use aspect to justify ever larger fisheries for toothfish and krill, which undermines the uh, overall mission of Camelar, which is uh, that rational use is subservient to conservation, if you read Article 2 carefully. Uh, one of the issues, and we can't change this given the uh, reasons why we have consensus in Camelar and, and indeed the Antarctic Treaty System as a whole, but it's very hard to make decisions. And uh, in that broad sense, I think the soul of Camelar is at stake as we move into the future, because if we can't solve this rational use question and agree that the primary purpose is conservation, then it's not going to look uh, so good going forward. In terms of successes, to me, one of the most important was in 2009, when they finally agreed on a way to allocate the krill catch. It was based on a really innovative party put forward by Ukraine. Um, and I want to salute my Ukrainian colleagues uh, for that and for all their work since. The conservation measure 5107 slowed down massive development, and it's been a great uh, tool over the years, but the measure needs to be renewed this year. And as we speak, its fate is uncertain, so we don't know what Camelar will do about CM 5107 this year. Uh, the MPAs have been mentioned. Uh, in 2008, Camelar took a bold step when it finally began considering designated large marine protected areas. In 2011, it agreed on conservation 9104, and that provides the decision-making framework for establishing the MPAs, along with their research and monitoring programs, which are crucial, crucial to their operation. And finally, in 2012, they formally agreed to create what was called a representative network of MPAs. Uh, following that, the Scientific Commission began evaluating several proposals, including the Ross Sea, that was a long four-year struggle, but a cut-down version of the original NGO and USNZ proposals was designated in 2016. And as Evan noted, it is the largest MPA in the world uh, still today. Um, but as Evan uh, noted, since then, none of the other pending proposals have been approved for the uh, Waddell Sea around East Antarctica and around the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, now, why is that? Well, there are a lot of different uh, theories, I suppose, but I think the two that strike out to me most are the scientific committee has been politicized to some extent, and I think it's more difficult today for the uh, SC to provide uh, the best science-based advice possible. Uh, the, the people who come to the scientific committee these days are quite different in some respects to the 80s and 90s, uh, and they have political instructions from some governments and that never really was the case in the early days. And then partly it reflects this ongoing debate about the place of rational use. For its part, ASOC has lobbied intensively for MPA since the year 2000. Um, and we're working hard on the three I just mentioned. And uh, Jack, if somebody could put up the illustration that I wanted to have added, can that be put up now on the screen? Okay, so this uh, illustration. Jim, maybe just a couple of minutes on this, because uh, now that Olivier has joined oh. us, we'll wish to go to him. Thank yeah, you. Right. Uh, I just I'm closing with this. 
So this was our original vision from ASOC in 2013, and it's part of a publication that we put out that year for all the Camelor members, uh, explaining what a true circumpolar uh, network of representative areas would look like and the ecological and scientific basis for it. And so these sites remain what we think should be the guiding model for Camelar uh, going forward. And uh, the booklet, uh, I, if anybody's interested, they can write me a note and I'll send you a link to it. But I think it's still the best source of a comprehensive analysis of MPAs, the, 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 the value of MPAs and the places that they're most needed uh, published to date. And with that, I'll close. Thank you very much, Evan. Jim, thank you very much. Um, Olivier, we now have you with us. It's That is very good news. Um, we uh, started out, you've already been introduced uh, to the audience. Um, and so uh, if you uh, would like to, at this point, tell us about uh, France's views on Camelar and what it has uh, achieved over the past 40 years, we could we could start there if you're willing. Yes, thank you very much, and my apologies for being for being late. Late. Can you hear me clearly? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. Good. It's very good to see you again, um, uh, Ivan, and to see uh, Francisco, also old friend from from, from Camelar. So from my from my from my perspective, I've been in Camelar uh, from 2012 to 2016 as the head of the French uh, delegation to that uh, organization. So you asked me to make a presentation of five minutes. So I try to stick to my five minutes. For France, Camelar is a, is a very important organization. Uh, you all know that since the 19th century, France has been very much involved in the exploration of uh, Antarctica, especially since uh, 1814, when Dumont d'Urville uh, discovered what we call now Terra Adélie, uh, which makes France today one of the claimant states in the Antarctic Treaty System. And in Antarctica, we have two two stations, Dumont d'Urville, which is a coastal station, and, and Concordia, uh, which is an inland station in partnership with uh, Italy. Um, so since the, uh, France is a claimant state of the Antarctic Treaty, Antarctic Treaty of 1959, uh, France was also at the origin of the Madrid Protocol to enforce the Antarctic uh, environmental protection. Uh, and France, of course, is a signatory uh, party of the Camilla Convention. So since France, I would like to put Camelar in this big picture that uh, the involvement of France uh, in the exploration, uh, conservation, and protection of the Antarctic, uh, on the Antarctic continent and the Antarctic Ocean, which is uh, at the core of French uh, foreign policy in this part of the world. <clears throat> the position of France in Camelar is very specific because we have waters under jurisdiction. Uh, within the area within the convention area, uh, with Crozet and uh, Kerguelen uh, EEZ, and furthermore, uh, those water are some of the richest water of Camelar in terms, especially in terms of tooth fish, and uh, the, those fishery are very very rich, and they are a big part of the economy of the Reunion Island uh, in the Indian Ocean, from where the vessel. Uh, go to fish. I think that today we have eight vessels uh, fishing in Crozet and Kerguelen EEZ and one vessel fishing in the in the Camilla Convention uh, area. So you all know that there is this uh, the, the declaration of the president uh, when, when we signed Camilla and uh, through this declaration we say that we will apply the conservation measure on Camilla on a voluntary uh, basis. But it's a matter of fact that uh, France has always uh, um, uh, cooperated uh, with the scientific committee. We always presented our evaluation of fish stocks. Uh, we always respected all the conservation measures of Camilla within our EZ and forests. It's really, really very important uh, that our uh, quota uh, are validated by the scientific committee. And uh, France always stick with the evaluation of the of, of the scientific committee. So this is something very, very, very important for us. So Camela has been has been uh, uh, very important from France, uh, especially for those fisheries. But since 2011, it has been also a growing 
uh, uh, result of frustration uh, with the first presentation of the East Antarctic uh, 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 MPA proposal, which we table uh, along with uh, Australia in uh, East Antarctica. And I think that the, the, the frustration is not only ours, but the frustration has, has been growing with the rejection and the blockage of all uh, on, uh, all Camillar uh, MPA uh, proposal, not, not only not only in East Antarctica, but also in the Ross Sea and so on. Um, basically by two states. At the beginning, there were more than two, 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 two states, four or five states were pretty opposed, and then some states uh, came on board. But today we have an opposition mainly of two states, which is not only, to me, which, which is not only scientific, but which is also political, and I would say uh, strategic. And uh, this blockage within the within the Camelar, as you mentioned, sir, before the scientific committee has been politicized, and this is something which we see everywhere. And I can see that also, for instance, in the ISA, the International Civil Authority, where one of the two commission, the, the, the scientific commission, has been politicized also more and more. Uh, so we really regret this politicization of Camelar, and we see that it's not only Camelar, but the whole Antarctic Treaty system which is at stake, because the behavior of those states which we see in Camelar is the same uh, within the Antarctic, Antarctic, uh, Antarctic Treaty meetings, and uh, we are very, very concerned of that, and it's very difficult today to find a way out. I will, I will stay here and be, be happy to answer your questions. <clears throat> Olivier, thank you so much. And uh, thank you all uh, for uh, terrific presentations. I, I think you've both explained um, why the importance of Camelar and the successes it's had over the past several decades, but also some um, incredibly important challenges and, and difficulties that it faces. And so I'd like to focus a bit on the future and the key policy challenges that the Commission uh, faces. And uh, Olivier, I very much appreciate that you've put this in the context of saying that the entire Antarctic Treaty system is at stake. Um, these issues of politicization um, are not just uh, in particular narrow parts of Camelar, but have broader significance. And so I'm interested in uh, the views of all the panelists in that respect. So um, uh, why don't we uh, uh, go to um, perhaps, uh, Tony, would you like to kick the this discussion off? What about future policy cha challenges? Um, happy to kick it off. Um, and I'll, I'll reflect on some observations made uh, just then by uh, Olivia, but also by others. And first of all, though, I'll talk about Kamala as being an integral part of the Antarctic Treaty system. And the convention, the way it's written, and the, and, and the obligation that the convention puts on uh, its parties, uh, the obligations to the Antarctic Treaty itself are central to understanding Kamala and central to understanding the purpose of, of, of the convention itself. And I think um, any rational discussion uh, of the future of Kamala itself must, must look at those observations and, and place Kamala within, um, firmly within the framework of, of the Antarctic Treaty system. If, uh, if Kamala um, drifts off uh, in directions that undermine the Antarctic Treaty itself, um, then the Antarctic Treaty parties have an obligation to rectify that. And I, I think that's a, a, a very broad discussion and a deep discussion that has to be held in the future. The next point I want to address is, uh, it's been raised a couple of times, and that is the 
the, the politicization uh, of the scientific committee. Scientific committee is central to rational decision making, regardless of whether it's about conservation or whether it's about rational use. And um, there are two things that need to be addressed there, I think. One is the investment of, of all Antarctic Treaty parties, or should I say Camelot parties in this case, to providing the scientific information that is needed for best scientific advice from the Commission, uh, from the Scientific Committee to the Commission. I think that's very important. And I think the scientific committee should be left to make scientific evaluations and to provide advice without politicization. Um, and I have seen um, the politicization of the scientific committee, at least in the last um, few years, as, as being a regrettable um, divergence from the purpose of the convention itself. Now, uh, I'll finish off by saying that there are examples uh, of things that can be fixed, and I think we should be looking at fixing um, both of those issues for the sake of the whole Antarctic Treaty system. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, we only have about 18 minutes left, so um, I suggest that we, and as some questions are coming in from the audience, I suggest that we uh, be relatively uh, short uh, as we move forward. So how about, uh, Francisco, would you like to uh, talk about the policy challenges for Camelar? Yes, I think there is one thing that is quite surprising is um, that uh, um, both uh, the Antarctic Treaty and, and Canada have gone through um, difficult times. If they've gone through uh, the, the Cold War, we've had that war in Malvinas uh, and, and other uh, geopolitical issues that in the past have not really permeated the work of Camelot. And yet today, there's no doubt that we have large geopolitical tensions uh, that are um, exterior from the Antarctic Treaty system that are somehow um, having an effect within the, the system. We, we, we saw this is not only in Camelot, we also see that more and more in the ATCN meeting. And some, some of, uh, you see, for example, uh, questions within the, the scientific committee. Uh, there's uh, more and more politicization within the committee. Last year, for the first time, they were unable to agree to the totality of their uh, final report, for example. Some issues that remain open there divergent views, and this is very worrying, as, as Tony said from the start. Uh, one of the strengths of, of Camelot is the scientific committee, and uh, how uh, the commission sort of accepts and endorses and, and relies on uh, the advice of the scientific committee. So if we have uh, a scientific committee that begins to be politicized, and this is the whole system in itself that is in danger. And this is one of the, the main issues that we have to look at in, in the next few years. Thank you, Francisco. Um, Jim, policy challenges? There are a few out there. What would you like to focus on? Well, I think another one that is mentioned by uh, somebody, I've forgotten who it was, is climate change. And climate change is upon us, and it's having really quite harsh effects on the Antarctic marine ecosystem as a whole, and certain species in particular. 
And I think the decision-making process to use the best available science could use a real boost inside the Camelar framework so that they treat climate change at a very high level where it's now mentioned and noted and so forth. But to my way of thinking, it's not treated the way it should be in terms of decision-making about making uh, decisions. In terms of the larger political stuff we've been talking about, one of the ideas that I think, and many, many colleagues agree with me on this, is to raise the level of participation at Camelar meetings and Antarctic Treaty meetings to have more uh, ministers and so forth coming like we had a lot, many years ago. And I note that this year, there will be, as I understand it, at least three ministerial level people coming to Camelar for the first time in a long time. Uh, I think it always helps to get higher level people to know about Camelar, to be in, better informed about Camelar. So in their own broader lives as foreign ministers or environment ministers or whatever, they can uh, collaborate and help move negotiations forward. So for me, that's very important. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Olivier, what are your thoughts in this respect? Uh, you're on uh, mute. Yes, sorry. Uh, could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, I, w I think we've, we've shifted from the history of Camelar to what are the um, sort the challenges. of policy challenges it has in the okay. future and w what does it need to deal with from now on? Yes, I mean, but to, to, to me, the challenges, the, the, the challenges are first are economic, commercial. Uh, some countries, some states want to fish more uh, because for them it's, uh, it's, it's strategic. We see, of course, we see, we see China, we see uh, Russia. So first of all, we have a kind of uh, economic interest uh, which is stronger than uh, conservation and, and so on because those waters are international waters. So they are not national waters. So those states prefer to go fishing in international waters because they are own uh, national waters or waters under jurisdiction. Uh, the fish stocks has been, has been uh, uh, depleted. So this is this is the first challenge, which is which is which is difficult. And within the delegation, we see that within the delegation, the inter some dele some countries delegation commercial and economic interests are very strong and represented in the delegation and not in the, in other delegations. Um, in terms of of strategic in interest, um, I think that those states are also challenging uh, the Camelar and the Antarctic Treaty system at the same time, and uh, this is something which is very very worrying. We could also put Camelar in the broader picture of the BBNG negotiation. Uh, what is going to happen within the BBNG negotiation once we when we have when we will have a new uh, a, a treaty today the the, the force. The, the, the fourth um, international uh, uh, negotiations uh, has been has been uh, stopped, and we, there might be another meeting. Uh, but what is going to happen? Uh, we know that the BBNG treaty will not uh, will not impact or, uh, already existing organizations, so there will be no no change within Camelar. But could we have more traction and more political traction from the BBNG to ask Camelar? To take those measures in terms of of um, uh, uh, MPA, for instance, I think that within Camela we should not uh, feel endangered by BBNG, but on the contrary, BBNG might help to raise the issue of of those MPAs and as at a more higher political level, like like you like you mentioned, uh, James. Sometimes it's good to have minister um, attend, attending the, the the meeting. So. There might be a few ways to overcome uh, those challenges of uh, of Camelar, and with those tests, where, when you are talking about uh, climate change, it is something that they, they don't really they don't really want to talk about. I remember that when I was in Camelar, the US had a lot, of, uh, even had a lot of proposal regarding climate change, and they were they were all uh, rejected by, by by those states. So to me, it's a mixed. But what is very difficult, it's a mix of economic interest, political interests, and strategic interests, uh, which are very difficult to overcome. 
Olivier, thank you very much. And I appreciate your mem mentioning uh, bio biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, the high, uh, the high seas treaty negotiation uh, at the um, uh, at the UN that could create a system for establishing MPAs that's kind of worldwide. And so th there is that question about how it would uh, relate to regional organizations um, and perhaps spur Camelar and others to act, because if they don't act, then maybe uh, the solutions would be uh, imposed from, from elsewhere. So um, all of that is, I think, a very important uh, discussion. Um, so in our, uh, we have about nine minutes left. Um, we have some questions from the audience and uh, one relates to uh, Russia and Ukraine. So I might as well throw that in here. Uh, the question is uh, Russia and Ukraine are both members of Camelar. Um, and is the conflict involving Russia and Ukraine, Ukraine complicating the work of the commission? And I wonder if, uh, I think that would be a, 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 a issue of interest to the audience. So any thoughts about that from our panel? You get to volunteer. Well, uh, if, if I may, uh, the war began at the beginning of this year. So uh, at the last Camelot meeting, it was prior to the uh, beginning of uh, hostilities. Uh, so it's a bit soon to say what what impact it might have in the meeting itself. Uh, of course, uh, the occupation of, of uh, Crimea impacted fishing activities in Ukraine some, some time back. Uh, but I, I would say that uh, the war in Ukraine did impact the ATCM this year in Berlin in different ways. So uh, perhaps we might have something of that in the October meeting this year. Thank you. Other thoughts on the implications of the Ukraine conflict? Just to say one quick thing, Evan. Uh, we have to remember that uh, starting in 2023, Ukraine will chair Camelar for a couple of years, and that'll be also a very interesting situation. Uh, maybe maybe it will be an improvement, but well, it's certainly a reality. Yes, uh, very much a reality. Other thoughts, Tony or Olivier? Good. Well, um, I wonder if we could uh, return to this uh, issue of uh, politicization and what it is that that could get Camelar beyond that. What's the? Is there a is there a solution or a way of of getting the commission to go back to to first principles? Um, what's your thinking on that, Tony? I I think um, one of the things that that uh, members can do is to actually provide more and invest more in the provision of scientific advice because if you're in the if you're in the scientific committee if you're in the commission um, and you are an active provider of um, scientific advice um, to the scientific committee and, and and you have a vested interest in seeing that um, dealt with appropriately within the commission it gives you a lot of suasion I think also um, in setting Camelot on a path of, 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 of internal reconciliation, um, co-funding uh, international collaboration in Camelot science uh, is a very good initiative uh, and should be uh, the modus operandi into the future. Thank you. Other thoughts? Yeah, I think those are two very important points uh, that Tony has just made. If you look, uh, just for example, at who is doing most of the ecosystem-related science, it's not anywhere close to half the members. 
And uh, so the shared responsibility for understanding the ecosystem, which lies at the heart of making it work, uh, needs to be expanded. How to do that? Well, maybe there could be more joint projects. And uh, somebody was asking me the other day, why doesn't Camelar Secretariat itself take more of a kind of leading role in, in helping push those? Uh, I've never, of course, had to be <laughs> head of the Camelar Commission, so I don't know all the responsibilities that, that might entail. Uh, and maybe that's seen as being too much interfering. But somebody needs to take the lead, it seems to me, and really push up the uh, bar on the right kind of science that we need for the future and have it be as collaborative as possible. Thank you. Olivier, in that uh, context, and now that you uh, are in Kingston and you are working very closely with another uh, organization, are there ways that Camelar can work with other organizations that will improve it or uh, promote uh, conservation values? You're on mute, Olivier. Merci. Sorry, thank you. Um, yes, so, so so far there has been absolutely no discussion between between the, the IAS uh, International Civil Authority and, and, and Camilla. Uh, but I think that, as I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, uh, BBNJ might be might be a way out because <coughs> once those countries would uh, were opposing uh, MPA in Camilar in the Commission, um, if they agree, to, the BBNG could give the political uh, uh, attraction for deciding. Okay, we need we need to have MPAs in the Antarctic Treaty waters area and to say that. The competent organization is Camelar, so Camelar has to do its job and adopt MPAs. And <clears throat> if those countries at the high level, high level of BBNG agree for that, so Camelar will have to, de to, to deliver and they will have to behave on the on the right way within Camelar. Uh, but the the, the, the politicized politicization of scientific bodies. Uh, is really a problem, is, is really a challenge, which we have seen in Camelar and which I see also in, in ISA here in Kingston on, on, on the totally opposite way. <laughs> so it's not only, uh, it's not always on the same, uh, on the same way, but we have also this, this phenomenon here, uh, here. Um, uh, and it's really, it's, it's really a problem and it's very difficult to fight against because uh, member states are sovereign states and they have the right to nominate who they want. In the scientific committee, and if they want to nominate somebody who is not a real scientist but a politician, they have the right to do so. And other members are very uncomfortable to oppose that. Actually, there is no legal uh, tool to oppose uh, to oppose that. So it, it, it's very difficult, and it's all rely on the good faith of the member states. It's it's a, it's a, a very simple principle of international law. Uh, but once those states are not acting in good faith, it, it, it's very difficult to go against. Thank you, Olivier. Well, we have just about one minute left. Uh, maybe, Jim, I could ask you, do you have any thoughts on uh, mechanisms or processes outside of Camelar that could um, help Camelar accomplish its its mandate? Do you agree that BBNJ is is one of those? I certainly agree with that, and that would be a marvelous step forward on its own, of course, if BB&J were successfully concluded. But one other idea is, you know, in the uh, climate uh, forums, the IPCC is an international group of scientists that in some large sense is above each individual country. And some of my colleagues have been brainstorming about, well, why don't we have something like this in Camelar? And that would, of course, take uh, one or more countries to put that idea forward, but to have more independence and more collegiality, you could say at a different level, uh, if there was essentially a Camelar IPCC, but it'd be called something else, but the, the analog to that. Great. Well, uh, we've run out of time. I want to thank all of you very much. Uh, you all have such deep knowledge and background in Camelar and, um, it's been great working with you over the years. So uh, thank you all uh, for participating, and I thank the audience for tuning in. 
um, for this uh, for this view on Camelar at 40. Take care. Thank you.